Okay. So delegation. Um, the general purpose of delegation, the idea is we want to give another user program the ability to act on some subset of our objects. One thing we want to do is we want to restrict that subset of objects. So suppose you download a media player from the internet to run on your laptop. You might want to say, I only want this media player to be able to access my media files in my movies directory and nothing else. So that would be restricting which objects it can access. By default, any program you run has access to all of your files. The second thing you might want to do is restrict the actions it can take. So you might want to be able to restrict, can it send data over the network? You know, you might say a media, a media player should not be able to open any connection to the internet or send any data over the internet uh, because it's just playing my media. Whereas by default, you know, programs that I write and run can access the internet. So I want to be able to do both things. So we'll talk about two different approaches to doing this, the Linux, Unix, Mac OS approach and the Windows approach. Um, in the Unix approach, we're going to use something called uh, set UID, um, which allows us to change who, what our user ID is, and we'll use file descriptor inheritance, which I'll talk about. Um, and we can also make a program take on a particular identity. In Windows, we have a different approach we call impersonation, where you can um, basically tell the operating system, I want to start doing operations as if I was someone else. Okay. So, in Unix or Linux or Windows, should I or Linux, should I just say Unix all the time and stop saying Unix or Linux or Mac OS? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, and I, I say Unix just because not that anybody uses Unix, just because that's where the idea came from. So, when you run a process in Unix, by default, it runs with the same identity as the process that launched it. So, it runs with the same user ID. It runs with the same group IDs. Um, so what this means is that if, if I launch a program and there's some file that has an access control list that's not accessible to me, any program I run should not have access to that file. So for example, uh, in Unix, the password file is, is stored in the, the password database is stored in slash etc slash shadow, and I shouldn't have any access to read or write that. However, you know, what if I want to run a password that changes, what if I want to run a program that changes my password? Right, the password program. How do I run it? How do I change my password when I don't have any access to that password database? This is sort of the classic problem we're trying to solve. Here. Right, so in this case, root has some data. The root user has this password database. It wants to let me make very controlled access to it to read my old password, verify my old password, and then store my new password, but not do anything else. So it can't just grant me a file descriptor to read and write that file because I could then read everybody's password or write everybody's password. So it needs something more controlled. So one approach to doing this is to say, let's put the functionality in the kernel and add a new system call. We could have a change password system call where you track to the kernel. The kernel will read this file, do all the manipulations in the kernel. Um, it makes The kernel will then make sure that you have the, you're only ac accessing your information and returning it. Um, and this is a fine option, but there's a huge number of things you might want to do here. You might want to add this capability, you know, after you ship your operating system to add new features. And so adding it to the kernel is kind of, is sort of an engineering nightmare. So the question is, how do we do this without extending the operating system kernel? This just means we want ordinary programs that can do this. So the other option is to provide a program that when you run it, gets more permissions than the user running the program does. Or it gets different permissions at least, because you might actually want to run a program that has fewer permissions in some cases. So in Windows, as we'll see, the way you'll do this is that you will have a program that is always running called a, pro a service, and you will send messages to that service that has privileges saying, do something on my behalf. In Linux, what we can do, or Unix, what we can do is we can set a bit in that access control list on that file that says, when you execute this program, always execute it as the owner of this program. So if the file, if I create an executable and it's owned by me, when you run it, the program as it runs will actually have my user ID and my groups, not your user ID and groups. So that means this program can access all my data. In the case of the shadow password file, it means that root will create this program password, 
And when it runs, it will run as root, which means it can read and write files that only the root user can see. Make sense so far? Seems cool? Um, so this gets a little complicated now because you now have a process that's running and to some extent you actually have more than one user ID because you have the user ID of whoever actually started running the program. This is sort of the parent process that launched this special process, has some user ID, and we might want to know who that is. Because, for example, in password, you want to know which user are you changing the password for, which is a property of that process that launched you. We have the effective user ID, um, which is the user ID that was uh, gotten from the set user ID but on the file, or if you made a set user ID, set UID system call. So this is the user ID we're going to use when we access objects. Um, so we now have two IDs, your parent ID who launched you, we have the ID you're using for process. We also have a saved user ID because we're gonna let you switch between those two user IDs. So we need to remember what was your original user ID. So this is your saved user ID. And the same thing happens for your group IDs. <laughs> So the model is you are by default running with some user ID, um, which is your effective user ID, but you'll be allowed to change that user ID between the user ID provided by the set UID capability and the user ID of whoever launched the program. So the effective user ID, ID says, this is the user ID I'm using right at this moment but I can switch back and forth between different ones, so that's why it's the effective one. The real user ID is constant. It's always the user ID of whoever launched the program. Yes, so if I run password, the real user ID is me. By default, the effective user ID will be root because it's a set UID root program. Yes? When do you think the set of all so user IDs are just 32-bit numbers. So uh, these are um, there is not really a restriction here. I mean, there is a so there are, there are restrictions on who can use some of these capabilities. So um, you know the when you use a set user ID bit on a file, it always goes to you as the owner of the file. It always will make the effective user ID be you. When root does it, root can pick any user ID they want uh, for set UID. But let's go on and see an example. Um. Okay, so we have the set UID capability, and this is actually stored in the access control list. And there's, um, we can set GID also if I want to like temporary. If I want to have a program that makes you a member of a CS642 group. I can do the same thing by making it be set GID. Um, and there's a sticky bit, which is sort of a hack for the system that says, you know, you might, well, for example, want to be able to let people create files in a directory, but not delete files created by other users. And so there's a sticky bit that sort of addresses that problem. So what this means, though, is that we are going to use um, this capability to run the password program. Um, so if you do an ls-al on password on the password program, you can see that it has this s bit in the access control list that will say that it is set UID, and it will set UID to the user, which is root. So here are the system calls you can use to manipulate this. So you can do get e, get UID, get EUID. So EUID will tell you what your effective user ID is. Get UID will tell you what your real user ID is. You can call set EUID, will set the effective user ID. So if you set it to be UID, this is setting it to the user who ran the program. So if you're running a program as root, this drops privileges because you stop using the root's permission to access things. You start using the user's program to access things instead. Um, you can then raise your private privileges by calling set effective user ID back to the, to the root here. Um, so for example, what you might want to do is when you run the program, you might want to immediately drop privileges so that you only use root privileges when you're opening a privilege file. 
You can then raise privileges when you open the file to access it, and then drop the privileges after you access it. So this gives you a little bit of the notion of least privilege, because we're gonna to try to avoid running with raised privileges, except when we know we're accessing something secure. And the rest of the time, we will drop privileges. But the key thing to note is this gives you the capability of, in a program, changing which privileges you have at different times by switching between elevated and lowered privileges. So one thing to note is, you know, you can now say, um, there's a general problem with root programs, set UID root, is that they can read any file. So suppose the LS program was set UID to root, and I ran it and I passed in your home directory, which is full of private files, secret files. So because LS is set UID root, it can read all your files, it would then show me all your files. So if you were smart in building LS and you didn't want that capability, you could say, what we will do before accessing files is we will drop privileges, which means we will only grant access to the things that the user invoking the program has access to. So similarly, you might have like a mail, a print program that will take a, a file you, you produce and copy it to a printer somewhere. So that print program should only print your file, so it'll drop privileges when reading your file data to print, and then it will raise privileges when sort of copying that file to someplace the printer can read it for printing later. So we now have control over who we're acting as on the granularity of a whole process by switching between the effective user ID and the real user ID. Make some sense? So the problem with this is that uh, it sort of is uh, it's very flexible, but it's very dangerous. That um, if there's ways, for example, you can feed input into the program that will make it crash somehow or do the wrong thing, you can use that to gain control. So for example, suppose there was a stack overflow bug based on command line input, you could overflow the stack, make the program that is now running as root do something wrong, and you know, sort of wreak havoc on your system. Um, another problem that we will see in a minute is you can have race conditions. So when we're accessing files, we need to worry about the fact that you're running a root pro a program as root, but as a user, you can be running other programs that are accessing the same files and manipulating them. So um, we will get to that in a minute. Another problem with set UID is file descriptor inheritance. So by default, so when, you, when you execute a new process in Unix, it, any file descriptors you have open are accessible to the new process. So suppose you're running a set UID program, it opens some secret files like your pattern, your shadow file, and it then forks and executes a new program. If that, that secure file is open, then the program you launched will still be open. So if we look at this code here, this is a program that will start out by opening shadow, it then will set it, it'll drop its privileges by setting the um, UID and the GID to be the, the, those of the invoker. It will then fork um, and execute a program. So the idea is by dropping privileges here, we want to execute this program without privileges. The problem is that we open this password file, the shadow file early on, and it's still open. What this means is that the program that we run down here in the system call will have access to the shadow file because there's an open file descriptor. So this is a capability we're unintentionally passing from a parent process to a child process. So what this means is that if you create any processes in a set UID program, you need to be really careful to either close all the file descriptors you don't want inherited by that process, um, or you can actually uh, for every file descriptor, there's a system call uh, F file control, FCNTL, and you can modify the file descriptor to say this file descriptor should always be closed when you call exec. So this means that if there's an exec, the, the regular file descriptors will be inherited, this file descriptor will not be inherited. So this lets you control what child processes have. But this is a not a secure default, right? The default here is insecure and in that child processes get all the inherited file descriptors. I see people blazing over. This is kind of getting down in the weeds, I think. Any questions, though? People see this, yes. 
So there's two things. On a file, the segue ID event will just go by the owner of the file. So it says only root can create files if root is an owner. Only root can have files that segue ID to root. If you put the segue ID bit on a file, that program will run as you. So for example, if you wanted to write a shared game where you had a, a, a high score file that, only, that, that you didn't want people to see, you could write a game program, say what you need to do, and then you would have access to your files, even though whoever's playing the game doesn't have access to the files. The challenging thing is that if there's any bugs in that game program, they have access to all your files, not just the high score files. There is a, the system calls uh, for set UID though. The only UIDs you can set to are your effective user ID and your real user ID. You can't just pass in arbitrary user IDs there unless you're root. As root, you can just call set UID and become anybody you want to. Because root can do everything. Okay. So that is how delegation happens in Unix using set UID. Windows has no set UID capability. So instead, what Windows does is it has this notion of a protected subsystem, which is a running process that has privileges, and then you use inter-process communication to connect to it and ask for it to do things. So the model in Windows would be that you would have a password service, which is a process running all the time, when you want to change your password, you do uh, you send a message to the service saying, please change my password, here's my old password. That service will then read the password file, check your password, change the password file, and send you a response back saying your password's been changed. So the idea is instead of having a program that you run and invoke and takes on privileges, you have a program that is always running and already has those privileges that you then send a message to and get a response from. So it's a different style. It perhaps takes more memory because this service has to run all the time. But it means that you, you don't have to sort of let ordinary users start these things. So inside Windows, the way this is implemented is that all of your identity information is packaged up into a kernel data structure called a token. Um, so a token has your user ID. It has all your group IDs. Um, and when you communicate locally on Windows, your token is passed from the client to the server you're communicating with. So the server can see that token. Um, so the other thing to know in, in uh, Windows is that every process has a default token, which is used most of the time, but every thread can have a token. So you can say, I want to use this particular token on this thread right now. This is the same exact idea as the effective UID, except the effective UID is for the whole process in Unix, whereas in Windows, it's just for the current thread. So this would mean that your protected service, you communicate with it, I communicate with you, I pass you my token, you can then set that token to be what you're using on this thread, and you can then access any of my files as me. So this is a way, for example, so this does um, two things. It, it's a way to grant access to a service that doesn't have access to things, um, access to your files. So you might have an un, you might have a something that doesn't have a lot of privilege. You want to temporarily give it more privileges by having access to your files. It also is a way to have something that's privileged, where it will sort of access your files um, using this mechanism. But then it has its own private files that can access at the same time. Yes. So if you have multiple threads doing the same thing that require the same token would there be token for only one token so. so you can have multiple so tokens are actually referred to by handles or capabilities and so you basically there's only one token for there's only one copy of the token in the kernel there's just pointers to it so each thread can have a separate pointer to that token if there's multiple things happening simultaneously within a process every thread might be using a different token so the model in Windows is that you have the service that's running with its process token, which is privileged, you know, whatever private things that service needs. When you connect to it, it will uh, set its token to be the, the client, the caller's token. This is called impersonation. It will access the caller's data using this. It will then, that's sort of dropping privileges. It will then stop impersonating to regain its own privileges um, to access things. 
So this seems great. The problem is uh, people have figured out what if I start a game program and I'm not an administrator and you're an administrator and you connect to my game program because you like playing games and you don't really think about this. What that means is my game program can now impersonate you and become an administrator and fully control the system. So in Windows, if you are an administrator, you have to be very careful about what programs you run, what services you access, because they will get your full permissions when you connect to them. I mean, and with Unix is the same way. When you run a program, it runs with your permissions. So if you're logged in as root and you run somebody's game program, that game program can access everything. So it's the same problem, it's just slightly different format. So here is sort of an example of what this code looks like. Um, so when you want to start acting as someone, you call impersonate log on user, providing a token. You then can do things like open a file for our printer example. And then when you're done working with that file, you call revert to self, which will stop impersonating anybody on that thread. And the thread just runs as the process with sort of the normal user ID of the process. The other thing to note is that Windows has much longer system call names. Uh, and you know, part of that is that uh, they weren't typing it on paper when they wrote Windows. Unix was all written on a teletype where you were you had to type things on paper. Uh, so they could be have slightly longer names as a result. Okay. Okay, so next class of bugs. So what I want to look now is this seems great. We can do impersonation, we can do access control, life is good. The problem is that uh, the real world interferes with that. And a particular problem that happens is what's called a time of check to time of use bug. This means that you check for some security property, you're satisfied it holds, you then do something. What if that property you check for changes while you're doing it? So an example in a bank account, you might have seen this if you took 537. You know, you want to withdraw some money, so you're going to get your balance. You're going to check, do you have enough money? If there's not enough money, you abort. Later on, you're going to subtract the amount of money you want to withdraw, you're going to set the balance. So what happens if while you're executing this code, somebody else comes in and withdraws $1,000 in the middle? So what's going to happen is if you had $1,000, you'll get the balance on the left, B equals 1,000. B is not less than the amount you want to withdraw, you don't abort. We're going to pause that code, we're then going to go withdraw $1,000. So the real balance is now zero, but the code on the left, when it resumes, will start running it will, uh, B is a thousand, it will set that to zero, it'll set your, your balance to zero, and it will let you withdraw a thousand dollars twice. So the challenge here is that that balance that you're checking um, is not actually the same balance that we're using down below when we manipulate. This is why it's a time of check, the time of use button. So this seems kind of abstract, but let's think about how can this happen inside an operating system. Uh, so here's an example. There's a system calling in Unix called Access. Access will tell you, do you have access to a file? So you might want to do this in this print spooler example to say, does the person printing a file have access to the file they want to print? So I'm going to call Access on 10 my file. It says, OK, I'm great. I'm then going to open the file. So note, um, I'm going to open the file. I'm going to read the file, close it, and print it out or something like that. So where can this go wrong? Yes? I got the game access sort of like the administrator. OK, so it's true. Right after that access call, um, somebody could change the permissions on my file. So that you might not have that. When you do the open call later on, it might you might not have access to the file anymore at that point. You're absolutely correct. Any other things that could happen? Yes. Right, I think you've seen this before, I can tell. So the other thing you could do is you could say, I'm actually going to replace my file with a symbolic link to some system file like a password file. So you're going to check that I have permissions to my file, which is nice and benign. So you know, if I want to print my file, the principal will say you have access to the file, great. I'm then going to switch it to a symbolic link to the password file that I don't have access to. The principal then opens the password file, reads it, prints it out, and prints out the password file for me. So again, there's a time of check, which is this access call, and then there's a use when we're opening it. And there's a window here when the file could change. So this is a race condition because 
there's one piece of code that's executing here, and it's racing with other code that is actually manipulating the file system. So there's a question. This looks pretty easy and fast, right? <coughs> so, you know, it seems like the window between access and open is really small. How would you ever take advantage of this? Any thoughts on how you could actually take advantage of this? Um, right, because, you know, it's going to be, you know, microseconds between these two calls, perhaps. Yes. Well, so this pro this you could this program is like a system program provided by the administrator, not you. So the administrator could add the layer, but that would be foolish. So as a normal user, what could you do? Yes. So it's true. You could grab a debugger instead of breakpoint. However, would you would do you think the system would let a normal user attach a debugger to a program that's running as root? And the answer is usually no, because you could then, you know, if the debugger, you can actually change values in memory. Um, if there's any secret information, you can print out the copies of memory. So normally, when a program is sent to ID root, you can't run, you can't attach a debugger to it and see it executing as well as running as root. Yes? Uh, make my file really large so it takes long time to open. Okay, so you could do the, so you're getting close. The problem is when you open a file, it doesn't read the content. So even if the file is a terabyte, all open is doing is reading the metadata. And it has to read the metadata for the slash, for the root directory, the temp directory, and for my file. Yes? You can try it over and over again. Right, so one thing is you could say, if we just do this a billion times, the chances of getting in that window is higher. So that's a, that's a great approach. You know, if nobody's paying attention, if somebody's looking, they might get suspicious that you see you're running this program a billion times, but maybe not. Yes? May has very long consent over A, consent over B, or C, or D. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of time to find five five, so it gives you some time. Right, exactly. So if you can make the path, it doesn't have to be slash 10 slash my file. You could have you know 16 directories deep, and you could have each entry be a symbolic link to another 16 directory deep entry, so that you're actually accessing thousands of different files to open the file. So this means that the that after you do the access, you're going to do that all over again in the open, and you have to repeat that same process. And as long as you can swap the file out before it gets to the end of that process, you can do it. And so people actually do this, I think they call it a maze, where you create this maze of files that are linked together, so when you get to the lab, so it's very slow, maybe you know tens of milliseconds to open a file. And that gives you a window to change the file out. So here's an example, and this is something people have actually done, this example. So this is exactly what was being mentioned, is um, code is calling access on my file. We're then going to do a symbolic link um, of, a, um, of the root SS, uh, SSH keys to my file. When it calls open my file with read, it'll actually be opening that uh, RSA key file and then printing out the root secret key. So, um, this is a problem. So what do we do about this? Okay, so the problem is the access and the open aren't atomic. Because the time of check is separate from time of use, we'd like those to be the same time. How do we do that? So the thing about access is access is using the real user ID, not the effective user ID in this case. Whereas open is using the effective user ID. So what we need to do um, is actually sort of combine those two operations in one. So here's what you should be doing. Get your effective ID, get your real user ID. Call set your effective user ID to be your real user ID. This will drop privileges so you're now acting as the user running the program. You can then open the file, read it, um, and the thing here is that that access check happens as part of open now, instead of as part of the access call. So this means that we have atomically done the access check in the open, and we've done it by setting the effective UID to be the real user's ID here, um, instead of having a separate access call. So the general rule of thumb here is that this access call is kind of a guaranteed security problem. 
if you ever use it, because if you use the access call and then you do something based on it, whatever you learn from the access call might change by the time you do something. So it's a system call you should always avoid in general. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so moving on from delegation, the next thing I want to talk about is confinement. So confinement is really the sort of a flip side of delegation where you have less privileged code that, so if delegation was about somebody more privileged trying to delegate access to somebody less privileged. Here, confinement is you are a normal user and you want to run some code and you want to confine what it can do and prevent it from leaking data. So this problem often comes up in the context of things like a browser plugin that you want to run a browser plugin, but you don't want that browser plugin to be able to access all your files and ship them over the internet. Or you're running a Java program or JavaScript program on a website, and you again don't want it to ship your files everywhere. So the problem is that if you just run an arbitrary program as yourself, then it can store the data in memory, and if there's some way, you know, whatever data it sees, if there's some way that the creator owner of that program can contact it, it can retrieve your data. So suppose you are you know, running a data analysis program, uh, somebody else has programmed to analyze your data, whoever created that program could then ask that data analysis program, what did you find? So if you download, you know, for example, if you're using Excel, Microsoft could potentially contact Excel and say, tell me what spreadsheets you've seen recently. And Excel could give them to Microsoft. Another problem that could happen is that when you run a program, it could just store a copy of what it's doing to the home directory of whoever created that untrusted program and just give all your data away. Um, it can also write data to a temporary location where the um, owner can then pick the data up and delete it so there's no real record of this data being sent away or exfiltrated. The other thing that it can do is that the program you're running can just send messages to anybody it wants to on your computer on the internet to give all your data away. So this is sort of a, this also comes up very much in the context of applications on phones, right? This is a lot of what we worry about on phones. We don't want your application looking at your sensitive data or your pictures and then uploading them to some random website you don't trust. So the more general problem we're thinking about is we want to run a pro running a program as a user in a standard operating system gives the program the full permissions of the user. So it gives you access to all of your files and to the network as the user. And so we want to know how can we restrict those capabilities to limit what's data, data is available and what you can do with it. So this is very much like delegation, but it's really trying to restrict things down. So one way to do this is to try to restrict the privileges. So the question is, in a system like Linux or Windows with user IDs and group IDs, how do you let users sort of confine a program to have less access than they do? Right, because, um, you know, because it's running as you, even if you created a special group for this program, uh, the access control check rules will always see, oh, it has the same user ID as you do and so it will have your access. So one thing you can do in Linux and people do is you can create another user ID for everybody to run untrusted code. So I can have a like mike.untrusted user, user account that I use set your ID to switch to whenever I want to run untrusted programs, um, and that could work. In Windows, there's a mechanism called a restricted token. This is something I actually implemented. Uh, did get used for five years, but um, it's out there now. So the idea of the restricted token is that we are going to give your program two separate tokens in effect. We're going to give it your normal privileges and then there's a set of restrictions. And these are also just group IDs effectively. And we change the access control rule. The access control rule now says you as a normal user have to have access to a file and the restrictions, whatever the restrictions are, those restrictions have to have access. So when we run a program like Microsoft Word, we can set a restriction that says the restriction is the group Microsoft Word. Then on Word documents, I can then put an ACL that says Mike has full access and Word has full access. But on my Excel documents, I will not put this Word has full access. I'll put Excel has access. So when Word runs, we'll run it with a restricted token with restriction of Word. 
When it then tries to open the file, it'll see that Mike has access. It will then check if the restrictions have access, which will be true for Word documents and nothing else. So this mechanism basically adds an extra layer of access control checks beyond the normal ones um, that allow you to get around things like all granting all access, because we are going to require that those restrictions also get access. So this lets us sort of confine access to a very, very small set of objects. So um, on Windows, in some cases, when you download code off the internet and run it, it might run with a restricted token that grants it access only to one directory, for example, um, and may not grant it any access to the network. Um, for a browser, for example, you might only grant a browser access to the profile directory for the browser instead of granting it access to everything. So that's kind of the big idea is we can use access control lists by adding new entries that also have to have access in addition to. So it's sort of a very limited piece of logic that you have access and the program has access. Make sense? Okay, so there's another solution. This is implemented at Berkeley um, for on a Unix style system. And you know, again, the problem is that the normal system calls don't have fine grained act, don't have fine enough grained access control or you don't have permission as a user to actually change access control lists. So the problem with that restricted token mechanism is what if I want to grant access to a file I don't own? That means I can't change the Apple, so I can't grant access to it. So the model that was used um, in system call checks is that we are basically going to insert a handler for every system call a process makes. We're going to run a piece of code. We're going to not execute that system call, we're going to go to some other process, run some code and see if it should have access. And it does this using what's called the ptrace capability. This is really built for debuggers because debuggers want to know when you make a system call. Um, and so in the system call, it will sort of verify arguments. So uh, we're about out of time now, so I apologize for stopping in the middle of the slide. But we will pick up on Thursday, um, assuming that it's warm enough for anybody to show up. <laughs> Um, and I will also be uploading this recording, hopefully, to the website later today, um, as well as on Thursday. Okay, any questions? No. Okay, our next topic is covert channels. So the problem we're looking at here is that not all information is explicitly accessed. So for example, explicit access is when a process opens a file and the operating system can check uh, should the process have access to the file. The issue we look at in covert channels is, what if we want to control information leakage? So we want to see, is a process leaking information somehow that somebody else could see it? So one example of this is, um, you could actually think about encoding information and how many CPU seconds you're using. So if you're a program and you run for an explicit number of CPU seconds, maybe you run for 529, then you terminate, somebody who can see that information about how long you run for now knows the value 529. If that happens to be the secret key to some valuable information, you have now leaked it and somebody got it who wasn't supposed to have access to it. Another way you might leak information is you can vary the amount of compute you do to I.O. So you can do a burst of compute, you know, compute, do some very CPU intensive work and then pause to do some I.O. Um, and then compute, you can think about this as a way to send a binary signal. You know, for every second, if you're doing compute, that's a one. If you're doing IO, that's a zero. So some other process that can observe performance because it can see how much CPU it gets or how much IO it gets could sort of see this stream of binary information about what the process is doing. Another way to do this is you can, if you have a file that is readable um, by a process and it, the system has locking. So Windows, for example, has the ability to lock a file for reading when you open it so nobody can write to it. So in this case, a process that is supposed to be sort of confined and not leak anything could lock a file for reading and another process that is trying to access it could sort of see is the file locked or not. Okay, so here is some sample code that shows how you might send data covertly through file locks. And again, the idea is you have some process that is not supposed to leak information that wants to transfer information to someone else. So the first routine we need is a way to set a value. So this passes a binary value, which is true or false, and it does this by opening the file and locking it for read or by leaving the file closed. So if the value is true, this code will loop until um, it's able to open the file. Um, if the file is already open, it'll keep waiting for someone else to close it, and then it will open it uh, to make sure that it has the file open. 
And if the value is false, it will close the file. To read the value in a file, the code will try to open the file, and if the file is open, it returns true, and if the file is closed, it returns false. So this error means that somebody else is has the file open and you can't access it. So let's look at how we send data. So to do this, we need three different files. We need a data file to transfer data. We need a send clock and receive clock to synchronize the sender and the receiver of data. So to send a bit, what the sender will do is it'll set the value into the data file. It will then set a value into the send clock file, setting it to true. This true value indicates that there is valid data in the data file. The receiver um, will sort of keep looping, waiting for the send clock to become true. It will then receive the value by getting the value from the data file, which is the bit being transmitted. It will then set the receive clock to true, indicating that it's done reading the file. Finally, the sender then has to know when the receiver has received the file, so it will wait until the receive clock is true. And when it's done, it will set the send clock to false, saying that it's getting ready to send the next file. So the receiver um, waiting for the send clock to become false. When the send clock is false, it will reset the receive clock to false and the whole thing can repeat again. So using this code, two programs that are not allowed to communicate because they don't have shared write access to anything can communicate just by locking and unlocking a file and testing whether that file is unlocked. So the broader picture of what we're getting at is that there's different kinds of access control. What we've talked about so far is what's called discretionary access control. This is what is used by Unix and Windows and it means that access control is really an option. That as the owner of data, you can control how it's shared. You can set the access control list. You can decide who gets to access it. Um, and also it means that when you have access to data, you can sort of do anything you want to with that data. So you can pass permission to any other subject once you get access You know, with, with capabilities. This would be by passing the capability. With access control list, this might be creating a new file and passing that file along to someone else. So as an example of access control list, if um, a student in, in 642 can create homework solutions and then they can, uh, a TA in 642 can create homework, sorry, a student in 642 can create homework solutions and share it with all their students. Um, and there's no way to stop that because it's up to the students in 642 to decide who they share with. Similarly, if I create homework solutions and give it to the TAs, a malicious TA could give it to all the students and there's no way for me to stop students the TA is from giving the information to students. So what do we do if we actually want to tightly control how information can be used? You know, think about a military situation. We have top secret information. You want to make sure that it can't be leaked by someone like Edward Snowden. So the solution is what's called mandatory access control. And this is a security policy where the decisions are made by administrators, not by the normal users and creators of data. This means that users cannot decide the policy, they can't decide who to share with. This is tightly controlled by the system itself. That's what it means to be mandatory. So what this means is that with mandatory access control, the operating system controls what a user or program can do with the data after it accesses it. So in the example of the 642 homework, what we might decide is that once a TA reads data, uh, reads the homework solutions, it can't write to anything that is readable by students. This would prevent it from passing information on to students. So an example here is that I could grant homework access to TAs, and then I would set a, a, a access control list for the TAs that would say the TAs can't share the homework with students by writing to anything students can read, um, and also make sure they can't change the access control list on the homework file, and they can't pass a capability to the homework control file. So where does this become interesting? So this is often used in what's called a multi-level security system. The original motivation here was for use by the military and other government entities that wanted to have time shared systems that were shared by different levels of data. So you might have some top secret data that you got from your spy network, as well as unclassified data, such as what is the lunch menu at the restaurant inside the NSA building. You also might have multiple users. Some of the users might be the director of the NSA or the FBI or the CIA, somebody who's allowed to sort of see all secret information. You might have it be used by spies with some amount of information to what they're working on, but they only see their secret data and not other people's secret data. Um, and you might also have it be used by cafeteria workers who are publishing what the current menu is for the cafeteria that day. So if we want to do this, the standard way people think about this is they think about creating classification levels. 
And this says fundamentally how secret is the information. At the lowest level, we have unclassified data that is essentially public, anybody with access to the system. We then have confidential information, which should only, which can't be seen by anybody, but can be seen by most people. Secret information that is even more restricted, and then top secret information that only a few people can see. Now, this is a good start, but it's not sufficient because there might be top secret information from different sources or in different categories, and you might not have one person who's allowed to see all the top secret information on all the different things going on. So the second thing that people add is they add compartmentalization, where you now have compartments. So you might say there is a compartment of European security information where there's unclassified, confidential, secret, top secret. There's also a compartment for sort of special intelligence from the NSA, sort of uh, signal information that also has its own compartment, its own levels, and it might be just top secret. Um, and these things can overlap. So you might have some special intelligence that is European. So the net idea here is really that we have different categories and compartments of information. And for each compartment of information, we also have multiple levels of how classified the data is. So with this system, Okay, so we have this idea of security levels and compartments. How do we actually use these to implement a policy? The first thing we have to do is sort of define what does it mean for someone to be uh, at the right level to have access to something. So we do that by defining a security level, LC, for processes which are the subjects that can do things, and for data and communication channels which are the objects you might want to have access to. Um, here, L is a classification level, top secret, secret, uh, confidential, unclassified, and C is a compartment, Europe, special intelligence, Asia, South America, India, United States. We assign a clearance to every process, which sort of says, uh, what is this process authorized to do? Is it authorized for top secret data and for which compartments, European intelligence only, for example, and objects have a classification that say how secret is the information and what compartment is it into? So you might have some information from Europe that is confidential, but not secret. And that would be the clearance level, that would be the classification for the object. We can then define a dominance relationship to say, when is something more secret than something else? And we do that by saying that LA comma CA is less than or is dominated by LB comma CB if the level of A is less than the level of B. So level A is less secret than level B, and the compartment in A is a subset of B. So as an example, um, some data that is marked secret in European is dominated by a process that is has a clearance of top secret and compartment of European and special intelligence. So with this dominant relationship, dominance relationship, we can now define some policies of when access should be allowed and when it should not should be allowed. The first one we'll look at is the bell lapadula confidentiality model. And this is really about providing secrecy to make sure that secret information cannot be accessed by someone without the appropriate clearance. So there's two rules here. One is that a process that has a given clearance level can't read anything at a higher, uh, can't read any data where the level for the data dominates the level of the process. This is called no read up and it makes sense. If you're a spy and you're working, your, class, your clearance is confidential, you shouldn't be able to see things that are top secret. Similarly, if you're a spy and your focus is on European intelligence, you shouldn't be able to read even confidential information that is from special intelligence. The other rule is no write down. This says that if you're a process that has a clearance level of something like top secret, you should not be able to pass information into an object that is labeled secret. This prevents people who have very high clearance levels from leaking information and sharing it to someone else. This is the policy that would prevent, for example, the TAs from leaking information, which we might consider secret, to students where we might consider the students at a confidential level or the files they can live, read confidential. So more formally, the way we specify this um, is with a simple security condition. We say that a user at level LACA can read a file with levels LBCBF, and there's two options here. LACA is dominated by LBCB, or LACA is dominated, um, dominates LBCB. Which of these is it? So the answer is that the user must dominate the object. So the user must be able to, must be more secure than the object to read a file. This says that you can read information at your level, 
or at a lower level, but you can't read information at a higher level. There's another property called the star property, which explains when you can write to something. So here we say a user with level LACA can write to a file with level LBCB. And again, we have a choice. Can it write to objects where the object dominates the uh, user or the user dominates the object? Remember, our goal is to not leak information. And the answer is that the user can only write to things that dominate them. They can't write information to any place that has a lower level because that could leak information to somebody who is less secure than they are. So suppose we just have Bell Lepidula in effect, what could go wrong? So suppose we have some secret information because we're allowed to write to things that dominate us, somebody with secret information can write it into the storage of super secret information. Somebody who has top secret clearance might read it and it might be a lie, they might do the wrong thing. So there's a whole separate model called an integrity model which is intended to make sure that you only read true information from a source you trust. It's sort of the opposite of privacy or secrecy because secrecy really controls to make sure you can't leak or share information. Uh, and this is making sure that you don't accidentally read bad information. So the Biba integrity model is exactly the opposite of Bella Podula. It says that if you wanna make sure you're not corrupted, you shouldn't read anything at a lower level than you. So if you're at a top secret level and you try to read secret information, this should fail because you might be corrupted. So this might be a useful policy, for example, if you're worried about downloading information from the internet and having a program corrupted. So think about getting a bad um, attachment in email. You might wanna say that a program that is sort of highly secure should not re be reading information that came from a insecure source. The other policy we want here is that if you're at a lower level, then you shouldn't be able to write to objects at a higher level. This again prevents you from corrupting information at a higher level because you can't modify that high level information. So again, we can formalize this. We have a simple integrity condition, which says that a user with level LACA can read a file LBCB. And we have two options. Is it when the file dominates the user or when the user dominates the object with the file? So this is exactly the opposite of the case with Bella Pagula. Here, users can only read files if they're dominated by them. This prevents them from being corrupted by insecure information, so they can only read files at a higher integrity level than they have. The second policy is again the star integrity property, and it explains what can you write to. So the question is a user with level LACA can write to a file with level LBCB when? When the file dominates the user or the user dominates the file? Here the example, example is that the user has to dominate the file because the user can only write the things that have its own integrity or lower integrity because we don't want to corrupt anything with higher integrity. So one problem is if we try to apply both of these at the same time, then we have sort of a contradiction because we say that uh, with Bell, with Bell Lepodula, a secret information source can uh, write to something that top secret can read but a secret can't read anything from top secret. With uh, Biba, we say that top secret can write to things that are read by secret, which is exactly what's prohibited by Bell Apodula. So what this means is that you can only communicate within the same classification level if you combine the two of these. And in a way that makes these policies somewhat limited. So here's a quick quiz. Suppose you're administrator for www.wist.edu. You want to make sure that nobody posts fake announcements about snow and cold days canceling classes. You want to make sure that there are faculty web pages that faculty can change and students can't. Students should only be able to change their own web pages. Which of these policies would you want for web content? A second example is you're managing a file server for storing final exams. So as an instructor, you want to make sure that instructors can access exams for all their classes because they might be teaching more than one. TAs can just access data for their classes and students can't access anything at all. Which policy would you want for exams, for this exam information? Would you want Biba or Bella Podula? So this kind of brings us back to covert channels because we have a problem that the mandatory access control and multi-level security assumes there is some reference monitor that can actually control access to things. So if process one wants to send a message to process two, and we're using Bell Lepodula, um, and the level of process one is higher than process two, the reference monitor will fail. 
However, again, if we have some kind of hard disk and we can write information to the hard disk, uh, making it busy or not busy, then process two, which can access the hard disk um, for its own data, can sort of read information. So it, one of the challenges here with implementing mandatory access controls is that covert channels are a big problem because they can sort of directly circumvent these policies. What this means is that uh, in real systems, people find they can't prevent covert channels. What they do instead is try to limit them to be a certain size to make sure they can't leak more than you know a bit per second or something like that. So if you want to leak a lot of information, it will take a very long time. You can do this, for example, by scheduling exactly when you get to use the CPU or the hard disk to make sure that you can't tell between writing information and not writing information. The result of this is that uh, in reality, multi-level systems are sort of a hard unsolved problem. And what you see in a security person's office might be multiple computers, one for each different category. So here we have one for Cipronet, one for G1, one for NSAWet, one for JWIX, um, one for OpsNet, uh, and again, all separate computers because these covert channels can't be stopped. So this wraps up the second part of the advanced operating system lecture. Um, there's certainly a lot of other policies beyond the multi-level security and access matrix policies. There's decentralized information flow control, which is a multi-level policy where the label levels are set dynamically. Chinese wall policies, where you are specifying who can access, we're accessing some information so that it prevents you from seeing other information. And the Clark-Wilson integrity model.